and in particular diversity hiring. It's a huge push right now and happy to be here this evening. So um, it was interesting, last night we just happened to be on a clubhouse I know you're all listening into. And if you all are not on clubhouse, you definitely should be there. Um, what I would tell you just in general is clinical research, yes, it is a tough industry to get into. However, if you're flexible, if you are willing to build your network, if you will persevere, if you will do your research, that's something that everyone appreciates. I'm an industry recruiter on the agency side. Here I am. Okay. Um, so I'm an agency recruiter. I'm not a corporate recruiter. So what that means is I work for a recruiting agency and really represent, I mean, a ton of companies, whether it be small companies, large companies, sponsors, CROs, really anywhere across the U.S. I personally sit in Denver. So you'll see the Boulder uh, flat irons in my background. My early career was started in New Jersey, um, but have done a lot of work in San Francisco, eh, what is it? North Carolina, in uh, Georgia, I'm, I'm going, I'm going uh, inside. Chicago, uh, Arizona, San Diego, Seattle, all of those areas, right? And even if you're not necessarily in those areas, certainly you can be considered for opportunities. So the ones I really wanted to talk about this evening are more on the entry-ish level side of the world. Um, there is a major uh, uh, CRO that's out there right now who is doing a ton of hiring for kind of junior level, entry level individuals. These are not permanent roles, they are contract roles. Um, and one of the things I can tell you about the contract side of the world is it's a really great way to get your foot in the door. And I talk to entry level people in many cases, right? Everyone wants to hold out for permanent roles. However, if you're flexible on title, if you're flexible on money, if you're flexible on responsibilities, if you're willing to go on site, if you're willing to dig in, I mean, those are really the sort of people that are gonna get ahead within clinical research. It isn't necessarily just for right now, it all is also very inclusive of the people that are senior level individuals in this industry. My real bread and butter uh, is like manager through executive director level folks with sponsors and CROs some at the site level as well. Um, but it's, it's those people that are warm, that are friendly, that are responsive, that even if you're not looking for an opportunity now, you just simply never know uh, when those opportunities will come your way. So that's certainly something that I wanted to encourage everyone with. And um, in a little bit here, I'll pause certainly for questions as well, because we want to have this uh, truly be an open forum. And also to those of you that sent me an email earlier today and attached your resume or reached out through LinkedIn, thank you so much. I'm going to make sure that either I or someone on my team, most likely um, Gordon Haas, who reports to me here in Denver, or Cindy Laguda, who is out in the New Jersey area. Some of you may know, I know there are some more senior level first people that responded uh, to me as well. She does a lot of work with uh, regional CRAs and things like that. One of us is gonna get back to you within the next couple of days or so about your resume and letting you know what we might have on our plate. Uh, the roles that really that I have right now for people are going to be research assistant sort of positions. So those of you that have medical assisting backgrounds, you don't necessarily have to have a four year degree for these, but perhaps you're working in a doctor's office or maybe you're working in a doctor's office and take a clinical research certification recently. You could be an active member of uh, Black women or Black women in clinical research. Uh, you could have taken like an internship recently or potentially participated in some of the training programs that are out there. There's a number of them that are really good these days. Those are the people that are suited for these roles. They can be up to 
$20 an hour, and they are in a variety of locations across the US. They're mostly major cities. Um, and those off the top of my head are, um, I know a lot of people are from the Southeast that were replying in the email earlier today. So Atlanta is one location. I know for a fact we're hiring in um, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, uh, Cerritos, California, Chicago, um, and a variety of other different places. I know we have multiple opportunities in San Antonio right now, including a permanent job. Uh, if you or any uh, of your friends are looking for a permanent job right now at a clinical research site, it's called a lab tech, but what it is is a phlebotomist. A phlebotomist with one year of experience, uh, that is a permanent job that is on our plate at the moment. Uh, we also have in Austin in San Antonio at another clinical research site, which is separate from this major CRO, uh, research coordinators, uh, which is another potential. With the major CRO, it's not, um, sometimes clinical researcher, research coordinators will make a bit more than 20 an hour, but these are really more kind of assisting the clinical research coordinators. So I placed a number of people actually in Rockville, Maryland last fall when we had the last wave of hiring with these opportunities and those people have since converted to permanent employees. So these aren't necessarily permanent for an absolute fact in about six months, but there's a good potential. And also having these companies on your resume is truly going to set yourself apart. The other opportunities that are on our plate right now are really their data compliance, data coordinator sort of positions. Those can pay up to about $18.50 an hour. It's like $18.57. Although I always hate to max out the rate just because when you don't max out the rate in a lot of cases, it will keep people competitive. So going a couple cents under the rate, me as an agency recruiter, in many cases can kind of put our candidates forward in the process quicker. But those positions are data compliance roles. What they really are is they're data entry sort of people. So maybe someone that's working at a hospital or in a doctor's office or something like that, that does medical billing, maybe medical coding, um, something like that uh, would be a really good fit. I know some of our other locations are Queens, New York, our Phoenix, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona. But again, these are all 100% on-site roles. And in these roles, if you're looking to get hired, they're all mid-May, end of May starts. So you would have to be available for these pretty much immediately. Um, meaning that you'd have to be available to start. If you're working, you would have to give your notice to your current employer, you wouldn't be able to like have, you know, two weeks vacation scheduled off in June or something like that. And certainly vacations in most cases are fine, as long as you let the employer know ahead of time. Um, you know, if you have vacation in August or something, that's fine. But we just have to make sure the people that we're submitting for these right now are available right away um, and they're ready to go to work. These require, um, I think they require TB because they're on-site roles and they're you know, working in a healthcare organization, uh, drug test and background check, which is typical uh, of most companies. So I'll pause there. And I saw some other questions kind of popping up in chat. And yes, we do have other opportunities, certainly, uh, including for people that are very experienced in industry, clinical project managers, CRAs, regional CRAs, we even have VPs of ClinOps, things like that, data roles, clinical data managers with a variety of different companies. But I'll pause there and see if anyone that's on the call wants to ask any questions in specific. And, and perhaps maybe, I don't know if uh, Danielle or Andrika, or I don't know Jasmine, I know I mentioned that with Jasmine earlier today. I don't know if any of you all are, are on the call and if you had any initial questions or if we should just kind of open it up for, for, for folks at the moment. 
Okay, Lindsay, I do have something I would like to say, um, kind of asking you, I know a lot of people are hesitant about taking positions, you know, especially when you're thinking of $20 an hour. Can you kind of speak on why it's important for people to possibly take that lower position and being able to, you know, use that as a stepping stone, you know, because I, I know a lot of times people are like, okay, I don't want to be a research assistant, but, you know, sometimes you need that in order to get in. Yeah, I love, love, love that question. Yes, right. And here's the thing, right? I mean, what I do all day long is talk to like super smart people and passionate people that are changing the world of human health, right? It doesn't matter if you're a, a medical assistant, it doesn't matter if you're a PhD, right? I mean, we always, we, everyone, wants to negotiate for as much as possible. Um, really, the reason is, is you got to get your foot in the door. And companies are paying what they're paying, right? And one of the things that you'll learn, you know, for me as a recruiter and most recruiters, to be very honest, most of our direct competitors are really good at what they do, and I have a ton of respect for them. But the reason you really need to consider these opportunities is if you're like stuck with a certain title, or if you're stuck with a certain, let's say, oh, you make 25 an hour and you don't want to take a step back. I mean, I wouldn't want to take a step back either. But, you know, you have, to, you really have to do it because that's what the jobs are paying at the moment. That's what the jobs are. And I promise you, if you take a step back now, it will help you catapult forward. And it's not just within like, CRCs and stuff like that, right? Uh, CRCs mean clinical research coordinators. This is also the case. I literally was on the phone earlier today with the OBGYN who is really passionate about what she does in women's health care and what's going to happen in the future. And she's just kind of exhausted and she wants to get in the industry. And so even her, and I was calling her by her first name, right? It's not doctor this or doctor that or whatever, right? But when I was having a conversation with her, I said, all right, how much can you travel? Ideally, what are you looking for money-wise? What kind of title are you considering, right? Because all of those things, if you want all of these different things, whatever they might be, I'm not saying that people don't deserve them, but I had to give her a real kind of reality check on what the industry is like, how hard it is to get in. And I promise you, taking a bit of a step back now will help catapult you in one year or two years or three years. It's the same case with RMDs too. And yes, Skyla, short-term sacrifice with long-term benefits. Absolutely. Somebody also asked a question about how long are the contracts. I think it depends. These particular ones for the major CRO, um, these ones are six months. And a lot of roles are very similar to that. I literally, before this call, was on a, uh, on a call with, uh, I don't know if there's any lab people on the call, but I was on the phone with the uh, next genome science, uh, sort of, which I don't even really understand all the like the scientific stuff because I don't do a lot of lab work, honestly. I do more work in clinical development, which is what I understand. But we were on the phone with like a super smart PhD that did her research and knows her stuff um, and next gen sequencing. And she's like, yeah, I'm so excited about this technical writer role. But, you know, it's only a four month contract. I said, you know, I get it. It's a four month contract. My place is hiring manager in October. I can tell you she's an amazing leader. Um, and your fit before in this particular role is remote. A lot of the writing roles tend to be remote. Um, but it was it was even kind of sell for her. It's like four months, that's not very long. I mean, I get it. And just to be completely transparent, um, even my personal situation, if you look at my LinkedIn, I know I'm connected to a number of you on LinkedIn. I actually wrote an article about this about two years ago. Um, I, I've, I've had to like comp wise, yeah, because we're primarily paid on commission. I had to take a step back comp wise to take a step forward, 
within the next year, I got a higher title. I got, now I directly manage recruiters and develop recruiters, but it was, uh, and I had to take a step back and I'm not just talking about a couple of dollars an hour. I'm talking about more than that. Thousands, right? yeah. Cause it's like that's, tens that, of thousands. Yeah, that's, that's what happened with me too. I had to do the same thing uh, cause I was in clinical genetics. So you, when you were talking about next generation sequencing I was doing that. I was the person, you know from isolation to next gen sequencing to analyzing the data on like um, using a software called Mutation Surveyor. So I'm familiar with that because I worked in the lab, but I had to take a huge pay cut to get in the clinical research industry too. And it was difficult, but those two or three years that I was working that position, it helped me now because, you know, now I'm at the CRO, but sometimes you have to take a sacrifice and knowing, you know, especially if you have a family, what can you sacrifice? Can you, you know, maybe do some jobs on the side until, you know, that high paying job can come in? Because for me, and, you know, I don't usually, you know, have this conversation, I tell people, but I did Uber Eats, DoorDash, everything to kind of compensate, you know, my salary while I was in the clinical research industry, because I knew that I wanted to be in this industry, but I knew that my money, you know, my, it was like, <laughs> my bills didn't change, but you know, my money decreased. So it's like, how do I do this when I know that I'm passionate about clinical research and still staying on, on top of my bills and, you know, my expenses. So, you know, I, I don't know if that's, you know, what people might consider, you know, if they're trying to do this, but it definitely is worth it. Yeah. Well, and I love that. And I did not even realize that, Danielle. So I should ask you, do you know any PhD postdocs are looking to break in the industry? Is if they have the NGS background and written essays, I probably can get them an interview like tomorrow. Oh, Dr. Uh, uh what's it? Dr. Javanese uh, Ling is on here. She has, she's a PhD. Um, what is it? A medical, where is she? She can talk if she I mean, can. Change a note with Dr. Ling. I thought I, Dr. Yeah, Javanese, I think I looked at her here? resume very briefly. I got like, I don't know, like 50 emails today, which I've been trying to like reply to everyone. So I apologize if I've not replied to any of you all yet, but I promise, promise, promise. Um, I'll do my absolute best. And if it's not me, I'm going to have Jordan Haas or Cindy reach out. I know there are some amazing people though that um, absolutely fit in our area of expertise. Right. Um, there are so, a couple, yeah. there are a couple of PhDs um, in the group. I know two. One we did. One we talked to on our wind down Wednesday. Her name is Natasha Gordon, and um, Dr. Javanese. She also has her PhD. But there are quite a few people in the group that who who have high level degrees, but are still facing that problem with trying to to get in. So um, we, again, I just want to really thank you for talking to everyone. So. Do we want to dive into questions? How would you like to proceed? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've kind of been paying attention to chat, but I'm also, you know, I want to pay attention to kind of what what's going on in the screen. So, okay. um, so I can ask the question. I can ask the okay. questions, or if people want to raise their hand, we can we can um, switch off from people who are okay with asking a question, you know, or. I'll, I'll start with in the chat. And if anyone else wants to chime in and ask a question, we can go from there. So let's see some of the questions. Um, okay, so Haley, um, the most persistent and dedicated person I know that is trying to get into the industry, she is in Canada. And so what, do you have any positions available for someone that is international because I know we all also on the wind down Wednesday we talked to another lady who lives in Canada but all of her positions were located in I guess the U.S. So do you have positions like that for people who are Canadian? Yeah so I love that question too funny enough I did another call with someone earlier today that was in Canada um so I would say like I don't know 95 or more percent of our jobs are based in because we're a U.S. based recruiting firm, every now and then we will get opportunities that are in Canada. Like I think the only thing we have right now, I know we need a backfill for, oh, it's like in Ontario. I want to say I'm not sure what the therapeutic area is, but it's a backfill for like a five-year experience regional CRA. Um, I also know that I'm recruiting a couple of term jobs. And it's not for a major CRO, it's a, it's, it's a known CRO out in Boston, but they are permanent jobs 
um, 100% remote. And basically what I need is a project manager for um, regulatory affairs, but it's a project manager specifically that's worked at a drug or a, a drug biotech or um, CRO. And they have to have like managed BLAs or NDAs. So, and I'm not sure kind of the level of most people on this and some people may be entry level. So I, I apologize if maybe it's some of it's either over your head or uh, elementary for everybody on the call, but a BLA is a biologic license application, right? It's what you need when you go to the FDA to get a biologic approved, right? Um, but something like that or a new drug application, and these are specifically FDA applications. Uh, so for a small molecule, that one can be basic Canada. And I also have a variety of regulatory strategy roles. So these are like senior managers through executive director level people. These are base salaries between um, like 140, 150, something like that. Base salary, US dollars up to maybe 230 or something oh, wow. like that. That's great. So we do get them, but most of our work is not in Canada. Um, and the reason is, I don't know if there's anybody from Canada here, but yes. the reason yes. is, is because in the US, right, in certain states, it's the same in certain states too, is that there is a lot higher burden to employ, and it's unfortunate, but there's a lot higher burden to employ Canadians than it is to employ US people, at least on the contract side, even for us, our burden is a little, lot higher. And the reason our burden, so our burden is 20%. So for example, if I place somebody for $20 an hour, our burden on that person is 20% for our like payroll costs and back office costs and payroll taxes and all that sort of stuff before we make a single penny at all. And that's one piece that people don't understand about contract rates and stuff. You have to have a certain amount of markup to even make it worth it to do right work. I think in Canada, our burden is something like 40%. And the reason it's so high in Canada that people don't necessarily understand is because of the healthcare, right? It's just simply the difference between US-based healthcare, right? And, you know, government healthcare and US-based healthcare is really kind of what the difference is. I do know there's a fair amount of hiring though in Canada in places like Mississauga. I don't really do work there. Our firm doesn't do a ton of work there, but I know there's some major biotech companies that are ramping up there. Um, so you might look and it's like, if you don't know where it is, like right north, kind of across the border, it's like central eastern Canada um, is really where it is. So, um, but that's, that's kind of what my answer is in Canada and to be able to go from Canada work in the US and I've absolutely placed Canadians before, but they are Canadians that have come to work in the US and cross the border on a TN visa, which a TN visa is a NAFTA agreement like with the US and, and Canada. Um, but they have to get like a special letter from the employer that says they have certain skills to come to the US and then you have to have an immigration person at the border that's in a good mood that day, basically. <laughs> Don't give you a hard time, um, but I have placed people. But the other problem is there's a lot of like permanent residents of Canada that want to work in the US and it's not as easy to do that. Um, and even TNs aren't the easiest thing in the world. I've, I've had TNs denied at the border before from Canadian citizens. Wow. So the so visa, there's, go ahead. So there's not any remote positions for Canadians that you have available? Right, right now, right now it's the CRA, it's a regional CRA, but it's an experienced regional CRA. Um, whoever is kind of interested in it, if you're qualified for something like that, send me a note and I'll tell you more about therapeutic area. Um, but I'll look in our Salesforce system and tell you more about that. There's that. And then remote, um, permanent for a CRO, but the senior level PMs and regulatory strategists. 
Okay. So also, she had another question too. And so with the writing positions, what kind of background does someone who's interested in, you know, being, I guess, a medical writer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I would love to tell you about that. So <clears throat> I also do a lot of work within medical writing. A lot of times people that have that background, they tend to be just in general, very analytical, right? They really enjoy writing and they really enjoy kind of the scientific and clinical writing components, right? So the types of things that I'm talking about are really like clinical trial protocols, right? Clinical study reports, sections of new drug applications. Um, there's a lot of opportunities out there these days. And we'll say we work with a number of like major, major, major medical device companies like in okay. Minnesota. Um, but they have a variety of different rules that are like MDR type rules. I don't know if there's any device people that are on the call, but uh, MD, MDD to MDR writers, um, basically the new device regulations. Um, also people sometimes in the device side, like the medical writing component that are engineers, right? You see more engineers in the device and the diagnostic world than you do um, like firm deeps and stuff like that, right? Uh, but that's really the sort of background that you have to have. And if you're interested in writing, I also am the, uh, the president elect of the American Medical Writers Association here in Colorado. I do a lot of work with them. And I have a couple of articles that I'm happy to share with you, or you can explore the American Medical Writers um, or uh, the American Science Writers Association. Those are two really great resources to use. And I can tell you, AMWA in particular is fantastic. There's an online forum and people talk about how to break in or you know, advice or whatever, you know, similar to like ECRP and SOCRA, but for medical writing. Uh, but that's typically the sort of background that people have to have. And a win to give you all um, a really kind of good, I guess, one of the very first people I ever placed in my career. It was back in 2007, like eons ago. So I'm uh, dating myself. But she was working at, in Texas and she was at, I think it was US Oncology in Houston. So I don't know if there's any oncology people on the call. But she was at US Oncology in Houston and she was writing protocols. And I saw somebody had a background in English. This person was not an advanced degree at the time. I think it's like a master's degree or something. But she wanted to get to the Bay Area and was in a long distance relationship, right? Her significant other lived in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And I literally, she was writing protocols for a major biotech company in oncology that's in San Francisco. And at the time I got her like a $50,000 raise or something ridiculous because she had the exact experience for the exact sponsor company. They loved her and they reload her. And it literally, and I'm not kidding you, it literally changed her life. And I placed her again, like right before I left my old firm. Uh, at a rare disease company. So, I mean, it's just the opportunities are out there. It just has to be like right time, right place, right position, therapeutic area, right? If you're in oncology, you may or may not fit in like diabetes, right? Or if you're a, I don't know, infectious disease person and you want to get in the industry, even though maybe you love infectious disease, maybe you don't, your easiest segue in industry is going to be in the infectious disease space because you're already knowledgeable in that space. And later on, maybe you can transition. But taking that kind of path of least resistance is typically the best way to get in. Not only that, I know there's a number of like CTAs, clinical trial assistants too, uh, from a couple of CROs that had reached out to me today that were interested in CRAs in that, uh, or moving up into like a CTM. But um, again, it's path of least resistance. And if you work in, let's say, early development in a certain therapeutic area, trying to transition to early development in that same therapeutic area, either at your current company or at another company, um, is really probably your easiest segue. It's like kind of like with me, right? If I was looking for a recruiting job, me going to apply to a recruiting job 
in pharmaceutical sales, recruiting pharmaceutical sales people probably wouldn't be the best fit for me. Could I do it? Yes, but it's not really where my experience lies. So I know we have a couple of other questions, so I'll pause there. I'm doing a lot of Tonight, so. <laughs> okay yeah we have we have a few questions here and so we have some people who have raised their hand if we could just keep the questions for the people who have raised their hands one question so that um, we can get through everyone's question um Nakia can you unmute your mic please hey hi Miss Summers I have 13 years experience as an acute care secretary, as well as three years of research experience doing bench laboratory work. What would be the best position for me to apply for to get more experience working in a clinical research laboratory? Hmm, it's a really good question. I like that question. Um, what location, where do you live? Where, what, what location are you? I'm currently living in Columbia, South Carolina. Okay, okay. Um, so I was just trying to think um, like what companies might be in that area. Um, so probably one of your best ways to get in, honestly, is probably through like a clinical lab. A I'm lot. sorry, could you repeat that? You broke up just now, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably your, one of your best ways to get in is through a central lab. A lot of the clinical research organizations that are out there, they have, they, they own central labs. I'm just not familiar if there is one that's out in your area, mm -hmm. but um, to give another example of someone like this, there is a uh, so someone with a with a med tech sort of background like you have mm -hmm. was in Missouri, and there's also another major CRO in Missouri, and so she was able to transition into a clinical trial assistant there, and then later on was able to transition into a biosample operations job, and so you should look at like sample operations sample coordinator, biosample sort of titles. Um, ooh, and I like uh, what Andrika just said too. Yes, yes, hospitals, academic research centers. Yes, absolutely. Um, those are really great kind of segues for someone with your background. And pretty much almost all of the major sponsor companies also have like biosample handling sort of positions. So does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. No problem. Okay, we have a question in the audience. Uh, this is from Marco. I have a background in clinical research data specialist and currently work for a CRO as a clinical project assistant. What would be the qualifications to become a CRA or drug safety specialist? Ah, yes, Marco, I think you sent me an email earlier, by the way. Um, I do not remember, Marco, what your background is. In a lot of cases, the drug safety background in terms of like education, a lot of times the drug safety positions specifically are really great fits for people that have clinical degrees. So nursing backgrounds, particularly like BSN RNs, sometimes RNs, although, you know, sometimes, um, companies require like four-year degrees. So four-year degrees usually is what people have to have for, for drug safety associates, in addition to some sort of like coding experience is really helpful. So maybe looking at drug safety associate, safety coordinator, safety coding, those sort of opportunities are the best fit. A number of the companies we work with, including one large pharma company based out of Chicago, actually hires a lot of people that are um, like critical care and ICU nurses, emergency room nurses, right? Um, that uh, they hire them into drug safety associate sort of positions. So it's usually PharmDs and RNs, not saying you can't get in otherwise, um, but that typically is the background. And then what are the qualifications for a CRA? 
I mean, I think there's a lot of people that are trying to transition into those sort of roles. Sounds like you're right about that level to move up to a CRA. I have something kind of similar to that right now. I don't know what your background is. It's for a um, small oncology company in the San Francisco area. You'd have to work on site. People have to have very strong rare disease or like rare disease, ultra rare disease experience or super strong um, uh, solid tumor oncology experience in San Francisco you'd have to have most likely drug company experience, potentially CRO, maybe from a well-renowned like academic center, but you'd have to have a lot of experience. But um, they're looking for like in-house series right now uh, to help out with a pediatric oncology trial. Okay, so we have another question, Jamie. Okay, hi. Um, I had a question because you talked about some positions available in Austin, Texas. And I was wondering, uh, could you let me know like any more information about the Austin positions? Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. I know we're recruiting a number of uh, like clinical research coordinator-ish sort of positions. We also have, I believe a regulatory associate that's out there right now as well. And it's like a one to two year sort of regulatory submission IRB sort of opportunity. Um, so that's what's in Austin with one of our kind of site level roles. The other one that's with, available with a major CRO, that is the research associate that's assisting the CRC. And then also data compliance roles which are um, like data entry systems. Okay, so are those uh, uh, the, yeah, I mean, the, the, the ones with the major CRO, they are, they're entry level. So if you have a data, a data entry sort of background, um, <clears throat> you would probably fit for something like that. And those ones would be 1850, 1857 is an X rate on those. And then also the, um, clinical trial assistant-ish sort of positions and go up to 20. Um, and those are looking for the medical assisting experience with lobotomy experience. Oh. Okay. All right, thank you. And uh, Jamie, she volunteers at a site currently. Oh. So that would be perfect for you for a transition. Yeah. Can I email you later about the Austin positions? Yes, 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 please. And you know what? I didn't even like think to like copy and paste my contact. I yeah. guess maybe I should have had like a slide deck prepared, but I it's didn't. Okay. So. I can um, I can post it if you want to. Let me see if there's, does anyone else have any more questions? Are, well, are there any positions? I saw something. Are there any positions in Chicago? I know you yes. had mentioned that earlier. Yes, 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 yes. Definitely Chicago. So same jobs that I just mentioned to Jamie, which are kind of the entry level data compliance roles uh, and also the research assistants. I know we have a number of roles with the major pharmaceutical company that are there locally. And although a lot of the positions are remote with COVID, they will be expected to go on site post COVID. Absolutely. So Chicago for sure. We do a lot of work in the Chicago area. And I just wanted to let people know to, if you're reaching out to Lindsay, let her know that you're in Black Women in Clinical Research, Black Men in Clinical Research. That way we can track it and you know see, and, and maybe we can go ahead and do this again in the future and uh, how beneficial it is to the members. Let's see, and I just um, put Lindsay's information in the chat and I'm also gonna put her email address. And I can do a quick copy and paste of my signature line too. Okay. These are, this is my contact. If not for me, somebody on our team. That's my, those are the kind of areas that our firm has an expertise in. So my cell phone is there, my direct work line is there, all of that sort of thing. Okay, let's see if we have any more questions. I'm pasting this. Okay, 
Let's see, we have a question. Well, is this a question? Oh, okay, okay, you posted everything. Does anyone else have any questions? Anyone would like to uh, ask her a question live? Oh, resume formatting. I love that question. I'm not, is that Ochelle? Is that how you pronounce your name? I don't wanna like, Ochelle, oh, yay. What is your question? I guess people are probably figuring out what's the best way to have your resume formatted if, you know, a lot of times, you know, do you want to see a resume that has a professional summary? Do you want to see a resume that has the skills listed? Do you want to see, you know, sometimes I know some people have their education at the top. Should they have their education at the bottom, depending on how many years they have been out of college? Should they list the buzzwords? Is there is there a clinical research buzzwords that people should be using? And a lot of times, you know, with the transferable skills and also tell people, and I heard you last night in the clubhouse, talk about how you shouldn't submit a PDF um, resume. And I, I think a lot of people don't know that that if you submit the PDF resume, a lot of times the system can't pick up on those words. And also I was reading that, and I know this is kind of crazy because I know I have it on my resume. They were saying columns, like not having, you know, words, like say if you are doing your skills and I don't even know how that's possible for me to list my skills without putting them kind of like in columns. But I did read that sometimes if the words are in columns, then it's a possibility they're not able to read the columns. So, I know someone asked, do, do you typically prefer a resume or a CV? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the people in chat, I mean, you're so on point with all of your questions. And um, everybody in chat and Danielle, like, I, I mean, this is fantastic. And so, um, absolutely. So I guess I'll answer the, let me answer the formatting question in terms of, I guess, CV or resume. I personally like resumes. And if you really only have a little bit of experience or are still like relatively junior, or maybe you have had a career before clinical research and you're transitioning, I think you should have a shorter resume than not. You don't necessarily have to keep it to one or two pages. I mean, that experience for our industry is kind of out the window only because there's so many people that are published presentations, right? I mean, research, all of that sort of thing. I prefer resume over CV. And the reason is, is because we usually read resumes like really quickly and not just me, but a lot of hiring managers do as well, right? And one of the pieces of advice that has become just, oh my gosh, so transparent with this pandemic, um, and even with how much black women and black men in clinical research have grown. And by the way, I just wanted to say, I have my calendar right here, right? I'm writing all of my, uh, I didn't have my biospace calendar this year. Um, I ordered one and it came just at the right time. And I write all of my candidate resume or uh, interviews down on my calendar. So that's money for me this year. So thank you for that. Your, the calendar kind of went, uh, I don't know, we couldn't see it all, but I guess because of the background, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put so it in front of, oh yeah, yep, yeah, it's completely, <laughs> yeah. Know, I don't know how it all works, but it's like, okay. it's, it's your, your, your the month of April, I think. Right, because you know why? <laughs> April is my birth month, so I was like, it's yeah. only, it's only right for me to, <laughs> to have That's myself right. on. <laughs> you got engaged in everything, right? Yes, I did, I did. Happy birthday! Yeah, that's yes. amazing. I'm about to you say know, April. I love how your organization supports each other. That's amazing. Thank you. I'm about to say April's a good month, huh? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, so you know, I guess back to the formatting issue is you got to make it like make every person in that process say yes to your resume. Make it easy. Busy people are busy. They do not have the time to like search through your resume and guess what you've done and make matches for you. And you gotta right. do that, that hard work on the front end yourself. No one's gonna hand you a job. Right. You gotta, it's grit, it's determination, it's stick to it in this. I mean, it's all of those things, whether it's now and you're new and you're entry level, whether you have goals of being a hiring manager, 
whether you are hiring manager, right? I mean, those are the things just in general in life that will help you get, get, get ahead. Right. right. I mean, I have an 11 year old son and I tell him this stuff all the time. I'm like, dude, turn on your camera and ask a question. You can't just, you know, um, you know, be expecting on your he's on teams calls just to be like in chat all day. Right. And so it's standing out and those sorts of things are going to get you get you get you ahead in life. Right. And so when it comes to your resume, you need to think about your resume in the same way. That first piece of your resume is some serious real estate, right? And <laughs> if you have your resume and there's like all these weird like spacing issues or all these like colors and fonts and it's like so distracting, right? I mean, you might like to be a creative person, but let me tell you people that work in this industry, it's like kind of outside of the norm and also photos, I'm not a fan of photos and the photos piece or your social security number or date of birth or things like that, be very careful about, right? Because those can be used for like discriminatory hiring practices, right? It's a big, 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 big deal, right? And so you don't want it to like give people like the reason like age discrimination or race or whatever it might be, right? Um, so I guess back to like that summary, you need to be very apparent about what you have experience in, why you're passionate and what it is that you wanna do. I don't love effective statements all the time, but if you're new or you're trying to pivot or you're something like that, that's what you need to do, right? Whatever it is that you wanna do, like Marco had a question earlier, right? He needs to put, Marco, you need to put on there what it is that you want to do. Seeking, you know, CRA or drug safety position. And I think an email, he wrote a really great, like, quick email to me saying what he wanted to do earlier. Be brief, be succinct, be to the point. Uh, one of the other pieces is in clinical research, what people really fail to put on their resume is their therapeutic areas, right? right. They might have, like, clinical research coordinator for five years. I'm like, okay, well, great, you worked with, like, an ophthalmologist. I'm guessing you worked in ophthalmology. What did you do? Were you working on phase three trials? Was it pediatric? I mean, what exactly were you doing? And then in addition to that, I mean, I get you only reveal so much information in the proprietary world of drug and device development, right? We all get that. But you can put things like worked on phase three rare disease trial or muscular dystrophy. I mean, you can do that, right? It's not like you're revealing any proprietary information there. Right. right. You don't have like protocol information or whatever it is that's on there. But don't give me or a hiring manager or my colleague or whoever else out there a reason to say no to your resume. And just know there's like multiple people in that chain. And I love the fact that you said mention your, you know, with black women or black, black men clinical research. I mean, I'll pay attention to people right away because I know your organization. I know you, Danielle. I mean, I know people like Andrika and Jasmine and right. I mean, we all know each other. So of course we help people out that we know and just it's the way it works in this business. Right. Right. I'm about to say black women in clinical research, black men in clinical research. I try and tell people that it holds weight. So, you know, put that if put that on your resume, put that as an organization that you're involved in and put that on your LinkedIn, you know, because people want to see that you're involved in um, an organization. And a lot of times, like you said, Lindsay, I tell people when it comes to their resume to connect the dots so that the recruiter doesn't have to try and decipher your resume and figure out, like you said, okay, well, what did you, were you, what therapeutic area were you in? And so I'm just going to put a little plug in here. Black Women in Clinical Research offers career services for people that, you know, a lot of times you look at your resume all the time. So you think your resume is good. And it's not until a lot of times someone else, you know, looks at your resume and says, okay, well, maybe you need to, you know, work on your alignment. Maybe you need to shift some things around. Maybe you're not including you know, some of your skills that you have, because a lot of times when you talk to people about their skills that they have and their experience, and then you look at their resume, that information is not 
transferred in their resume. You're not seeing it. So I'll just put myself out there. Like when I was applying for positions at the CRO, they wanted me to have patient experience. So because it happened so long ago for me with being, you know, working in a hospital, I completely left that off of my resume. So, you know, I didn't know at the time that that was, you know, hindering me from getting hired because for a lot of the CROs, they want to see that you have that patient experience. So even things like that, like if you worked in different systems, like if you use different systems, putting those systems down. And then a lot of times people think, okay, well, if I have this interview and they're asking me about their systems, it's okay if you're able to realize how that system kind of correlates to the systems that you have experience in. You never want to really say, I don't have experience in that. You want to be able to be say, okay, well, this is the experience that I have. And I know this, you know, like say if there is an electronic medical record, but you guys call it something else that's your company, being able to say, well, this is what we call it here. And this is similar, you know, so being able to know those clinical research um, acronyms, I think is very important before you interview, you know, especially with the position in clinical research, because people are going to ask you questions. They're not always going to tell, spell out, you know, what everything means. So it's, I feel like it's important to, to know those words. Yeah, it is. And then one other thing about the column piece, Danielle, that you mentioned, and also the, um, like the PDF versus the word, I think it's important for people to realize that you know, a lot of times like us as a recruiting firm, a lot of these major companies, we have to like put you through a portal, particularly for the contract jobs. It's called a vendor management system. The ones that industry uses the most, and if you've ever been a contractor, you probably kind of heard it through these systems, but their field glass is a major system and wand is the other major system. Can we use PDFs in those sometimes? But the problem is, is you have to take off it. They're vendor neutral. And if you also have any contact information on there, either from the vendor side, which is us, or like you personally, they will like discount your resume right offhand because it's you're not supposed to have any contact on there. So if you send me a PDF and it's for like all these roles that we're hiring for right now, I send you a note back and say, hey, Danielle, I'm sorry, I can't use a PDF. Can you send me a word? And they're like, wait, you're not going to change my word. Why do you? You know, it's just like all of these things. And in the meantime, while you're taking that time, somebody else has been submitted in that slot, right? I mean, it moves that quick, especially for junior level roles. I was just on a hot jobs call with our team earlier today. There's another huge major CRO that's out there right now. They want 35 interviews for clinical data managers within the next week and a half. Do you know how hard clinical data managers are, are to find? Uh, like, you know, that do start up through lock on the on the on the CRO or the sponsor side. But that's really how many opportunities we have at the moment. And the columns, even on a word resume, the columns are not always read easily. Like we use Salesforce. There's a lot of other really good tools out there, like Bullhorn is a big internal ATS and Job Diva, my last company is Job Diva. It's a great one. But the parsers, they don't always read what's on your resume. And if they're in boxes, like it won't read the person's name or their contact information or anything like that. And then for us, we Boolean search on the back end in the database. If we don't already know you, we'll look for you know certain skills. And if it's in those boxes, it's not put in our database and we won't be able to find you. So it's just best to not use boxes. Right. And right. I, I'd be curious yep. to know what your resume looks like, by the way. So <laughs> yeah, tables and boxes. I've used, you know, and I tell a lot of people all the time, like I wouldn't recommend our services if I didn't, you know, like with me using our services for the resume reviews, that is what helped me get a position at the CRO. Like I thought my resume was good, but you know, a lot of times people kind of, you know, and I know it's kind of hard sometimes when you have to self-reflect and look at your resume and figure out, you know, and sometimes it could be overwhelming with the amount of things that you might have to change. But you have to realize that changing this information on your resume, this is one step closer from you getting the job. So I always tell people, and like you said, Lindsay, like to be passionate, persistent, 
you know, because people want to see someone that stands out from the rest. We don't, you know, you don't want to see, you know, the same and have the same type of people in these roles. So you really have to put yourself out there on LinkedIn. And, you know, really, I tell people all the time, you have to make sure you are a well-rounded clinical research professional. Being involved in different clinical research organizations is so important to connect on LinkedIn. So with that being said, what would you say is the best way for people to reach out to recruiters? Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, I, I really love that uh, question. Uh, and I know there was another question that I just saw pop through that was good about how to list contract roles with the same employer. So probably the best way to reach to recruiters, to be very honest, whether it's with our firm or our competitor firms, which again, I have ton of respect for I can't bring up with everyone I can or CROs or sponsors or sites or wherever it is. Um, A1 is look at what it is that they do, right? I mean, if they are very clear on what they do and they don't recruit in your area of expertise, you may not even wanna waste your time, right? So the research you do there, right? If it's with, I don't know, some large pharma company and they're a, I don't know, a sales recruiter at some large pharma company, could you send them a note on clinical research coordinator jobs or CTAs? I mean, you could, but it's not what they do. And I can tell you that even these internal groups are massive. I'm talking about like 80 recruiters, right? And different divisions, they don't always even communicate with each other. Like, my company has admin support division, an IT division, uh, accounting and finance. Sometimes people reach to me about accounting and finance or healthcare jobs or something, and I send them to like a, just a main email address. I don't know people in other divisions, and they're at my current company. I work specifically in our life sciences division. And so that's first and foremost is targeting the right people. but. I'm going to pick on you, Marco. I don't know if you're still here. And his, his email was really great. Um, and he was very pointed. He said what it is that he wanted to do. He was clear, right? He was short. He was brief. He told me exactly what he was looking for. That's really the best way to do it. And super extra plus, by the way, for the people that go the extra mile and they pay attention to whether it's for recruiters. Or I, side note, I do it on the candidate side all the time. If somebody has a great publication or they posted something really exciting or I saw in their clubhouse bio that they're doing whatever, right? I'll say, hey, I heard recently that you were doing this. I heard you last week. Um, and I really appreciate you. Like, I don't know if you remember me, Danielle. I reached to you, I think in October or something like that of last year originally on LinkedIn, because I kept seeing you in my feed. I wasn't connected to you, but I was watching you. Like, I'm not stalking people, but I was watching you for probably two months. I was like, hmm, what is she doing? Like, she's on some really great stuff. This is amazing. You know, diversity hiring is like a huge freaking deal right now, right? And I was like, oh, I wonder what they're doing. And now I'm watching you all and you're doing stuff with like ACRP. I think there's people that are board members or you're going for board members or whatever it is that you're doing. And then there's all these branding people out there. And, you know, I mean, it's great things. And I say, you know, I said, I love what you're doing. Would love to connect. So yeah, that's how to approach people. Yeah, so I I personally um, talked to different recruiters and they said that, like you said, you know, you don't automatically have to, you know, reach out to the recruiter, but if you start to follow them and kind of almost in a sense, like I guess a lot of times people forget that this is, you know, even though it's LinkedIn, you still need to build relationships. So, you know, for me, and I think what has made me really successful on LinkedIn, in the beginning, I used to tell people, you know, happy birthday, you know, like, how are you doing? Like, so, you know, I know a lot of times people were like, did you really reach out to people? And I'm like, yes, because that's how you build relationships. If someone makes a post, you know, you don't automatically have to come right out to a recruiter and say, you know, never had a conversation with the recruiter and the first time you talk to them you're like this is what I want you got any jobs but you know I, I feel like it's better to create a genuine connection with the recruiters because I feel like they're more 
inclined to help you, you know, with the position, like you said, telling someone, hey, I saw you on Clubhouse, you had some really good content. I thought, you know, here are my thoughts or, you know, saying, I thought what you said was really important. So I think developing relationships on LinkedIn is very important. And that's how you really build and have those connections. And a lot of times, say, for example, you connect with someone and they don't have an opportunity for you, they can connect you to someone else that has an opportunity. So you never know, you know, almost in a sense, who's behind the door, you know, when you're making these connections, it's, it's very important. I stay on LinkedIn more than anything. I tell people all the time, LinkedIn is a gold mine. Like, you know, if you're looking for jobs, you're looking to connect, you know, you're looking to take your career to the next level. It's really all about developing that relationship and that rapport with people. And this was great. <laughs> um, I know we are um, past, you know, past eight o'clock and I want to be conscious of everyone's time. And if it was for me, I could go on and talk forever. I know me and Lindsay could go on and talk about, you know, jobs and everything because I know we're super passionate about, you know, trying to get more people in and, you know, like we know that there's roadblocks, but if you have someone like Lindsay that can help guide you and tell you based upon your experience where you fit in this clinical research industry, like don't be afraid to, you know, especially with us having this meeting to reach out to Lindsay and, and let her know, hey, I was on the call, you know, I was on the Zoom call, I'm from Black Women in Clinical Research. Like that is completely fine to, you know, for that to be your introduction. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. It's, it's okay, you know, that's a lot of times you're gonna get rejected, but just keep trying, don't give up. And so, Lindsay, thank you so much. Did you wanna have any, it's like the final thoughts, like Jerry Springer, final, <laughs> final thoughts. Do you have any final I thoughts? It. I love it, I love it. Um, I guess I guess maybe the only other final thought, and I mean, I have a number of resources that are pinned to my profile. I think maybe some people have seen it. Sometimes I post them on LinkedIn, but what I can do, Danielle, is I'll send you an email with like basically all of the resources. They include like, you know, good thank you notes and how to format a resume and how to work with recruiters and different career paths and all that sort of stuff. I'll send it to you and feel free to kind of disseminate it, use it or not or whatever for your organization. And if anyone wants kind of access to that stuff, it's either pinned to my profile or you can just ask for it in email and I'm happy to provide um, just kind of a culmination of kind of all the things that I've learned and you know, we struggle and we fail on our side too, and we're rejected all the time. And let me tell you, when people win and they get placed in this business, we win with you and we celebrate and certainly we make money. But man, let me tell you, when I have those CTAs and you can go back eight years ago on my profile and look at the people that recommended me, look at what they're doing now. And you see these people get promoted and they move up and they it is such a win, but oh, when people that are passionate and they they don't get an opportunity or they lose that or something they're really excited about, certainly, although yes, we lose our money, we're just as heartbroken for you all. I mean, and and you know, if you're good, good with people and good at recruiting and you don't have that passion, I mean, you know, we we celebrate with the wins and we kind of cry with the losses. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And we're kind of human, just like everyone else is. So thanks again for this platform. It was kind of great to be here this week. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining tonight. We had an awesome turnout. This is um, being recorded. So this will be posted soon on our YouTube channel. And thank you everyone. And don't forget, if you haven't had your resume review, get your resume review. So www.bwicr.com <laughs> and click on career services. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye. Happy almost Friday. Right. <laughs>